Republicans aiming toward 2018 face national fights while a Republican majority and president in Washington balance tax reform amid federal investigations. Some Iowa Republican perspective on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television, this is the Friday, November 3rd edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. The blueprint for Washington Republicans in early 2017 was aggressive. By this time of the year, they planned to repeal Obamacare, pass comprehensive tax reform, and weigh fresh infrastructure spending. So far, they've fallen short in nearly every aspect of their agenda. And in D.C., there are factional fights between Steve Bannon and Mitch McConnell Republicans. Here in Iowa, Governor Kim Reynolds assumed a role managing budget problems and hemorrhaging costs for the state's health care. So what's next for the governing party? Well, joining us to answer those questions are former Republican candidate for Governor Doug Gross and Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition President Steve Scheffler. Gentlemen, welcome back to Iowa Press. Good to be with good you. Good, good to see you again. Thank you. Across the table, Jason Noble is chief political writer for the Des Moines Register, and Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. Gentlemen, I want to open the conversation. <clears throat> Simple question to both of you. Start with you, Mr. Groves. Uh -huh. Is this now the party of Donald Trump? Oh, it certainly is. Uh, you look at the numbers, Donald Trump gets 80 to 90 percent approval ratings from Republicans. Uh, the one thing they're united on is being against Democrats and being for Trump. That's kind of what unites Republicans right and now. Mr. Scheffler, same question. Is this Donald Trump's party? I would totally agree that with that. It's because Republicans have uh, grown frustrated with uh, prior Republican administrations who've not uh, kept their promises and they're looking for somebody to shake up Washington and uh, get us on an agenda to save America. Mr. Scheffler, does that mean that the philosophy of Republicans has changed on things like trade, where uh, President Trump has demonstrably different views than have been traditional Republican orthodoxy? Well, I think a lot of Republicans, you know, have gotten sick and tired of all the nationalism, and uh, they're looking for uh, uh, fair uh, trade deals with uh, other countries around the world. And uh, if you look at the map here in Iowa, you know, southeast Iowa, traditionally Democrat counties, Wapolo, Lee, Des Moines County, uh, Clinton County, Dubuque County, you know, counties have got, been overwhelmingly Democrat, you know, where uh, Trump's uh, message uh, of getting America uh, back on the track again resonated with voters, you know, real well. Mr. Gross, when I told folks you were going to be on the show, they said, ask him if he's still a Republican. Oh, yeah, I'm a Republican. <laughs> Why? I'm proud of it. Why? I believe in limited government, and I believe that, you know, government is not the solution to problems. The private sector is is a far better generator of, of uh, wealth and, and quality living for people. So it's philosophical. Now, I indicated that we're the party of Trump. I didn't indicate that that's a sustainable effort long term. I see Trump as sort of a throwback. And the question I really see is having probably a party that's composed of lots <clears throat> of different factions right now, traditional Republicans. You've got people that are anti-market and, frankly, anti-international. Uh, and then you have young millennials who, frankly, are almost libertarian. So we're, we're sort of a coalition, as Paul Ryan says, without a parliamentary system. So that's why they're having such difficulty getting things done. Mr. Scheffler, uh, prominent members of your own party uh, have raised some serious questions about President Trump, his leadership, his temperament. How do you respond to Republicans like John McCain, Jeff Flake, Bob Corker, who are saying this guy is a danger to democracy? Even? Well, first of all, I think they were in shock when uh, Donald Trump was elected. And as Phyllis Shafley told me, you know, uh, we're looking for people to shake the system up and not the business as usual. And uh, when people like John McCain and uh, about six or seven other Republicans uh, promised to uh, repeal of Obamacare, you know, they ought to keep their promises. If they did, had no intention of doing that, uh, then they should have kept their mouth shut. 
Mr. Gross, how do you respond to those criticisms that we're hearing from Republicans about well, President Well, any Trump? time that you have a former, your most recent president, and you have a guy like uh, Corker, and you have someone like Jeff Flake and Ben Sass, all who are very thoughtful people and are conservatives, uh, indicate that they are appalled by the behavior of this, their Republican president, you know you have a problem. So I, my sense is there's discomfort within the Republican Party with Donald Trump about two things. One is about his style and two about some of the substance of his p policy positions, both of which I think are problematic for the party long term. That being said, what unites Republicans is their antipathy toward Democrats. And the fact that, the, and what we shouldn't do is mistake the fact that the Democrats are so weak for our strength because we are not strong right now. We can't get anything passed. Mr. Schiffer, is Donald Trump still marketable to social conservatives? Absolutely. Uh, if you look, you know, you, as you well know, 81% of white evangelicals voted for uh, Donald Trump. And he's done more for religious liberty. He's done for more for personal freedoms. He's done more for uh, the life issue than even Ronald Reagan did. So absolutely, he understands who brought him to the dance, and he has done very well in trying to fulfill his promises. Unlike a lot of Republican presidents of the past, including George W. Bush, who uh, when the Democrats said boo, they bent over and they wilted. So, uh, you know, I think people, are, you know, conservative uh, Christians are very excited about this presidency and what he's been doing. Mr. Gross, you are an attorney. I am. Uh, what sort of legal exposure has occurred this week for the Trump administration, given what we now know about Iowan Sam Clovis, who was a member of the Trump campaign team and has testified before the grand jury? Well, the, I, mean, I don't want to say that I'm in Bob Mueller's team or am a prosecutor, because I'm not. Uh, that being said, what I observe is the, the fact that the that the Mueller indicted someone who was participating in a meeting discussing Russia in a meeting where the president of Jeff Sessions sat is problematic for the administration. Uh, and where that leads, <clears throat> frankly, nobody really knows right now. But that is problematic, and that's what I think Mueller is focusing on. Mr. Scheffler, what are your thoughts on the state of the Russia investigation, and what sort of role will Sam Clovis have moving forward in Iowa politics? I don't know. I think there's a lot of unanswered questions, so I guess I'm not willing to, to uh, go into territory that I'm not familiar with. Um, but I think the bigger question here is uh, the abuses of, uh, you know, the Democrats and uh, particularly Hillary Clinton and Loretta Lynch and uh, what's unveiled here just the last couple of days with Donna Brazil, uh, basically exposing uh, what the DNC did. So I think, uh, you know, this whole thing about the Russian conclude, uh, you know, uh, being cahoots with it, with uh, Donald Trump and his people is is uh, baloney, and and there's a bigger problem here. The Democrats have got to deal with. It's going to be hopefully exposed here real soon. Doug, did you have something to add? You ex you sort of inhaled there. I, I try to breathe while oh, okay. I'm on the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think that uh, the point that that Steve was making I think is appropriate in that. We really don't know what's going to happen as a result of this. All we do know is the R Russians did a, made a major effort to try to influence our election, and probably in some respects did. Uh, and that's problematic for our country, and problematic for us as a free society, how we deal with that. Uh, so I think that's, that's a problem for us. Uh, about Sam Clovis, what place does he have in the Trump administration moving forward and in the Iowa Republican Party? Again, I really can't, I can't answer that. I don't know. I mean, I think we'll have to see how things shake out and... And I, I'm sure that the Trump administration will make an appropriate decision about whether to retain him or not. And uh, what happens in Iowa politics, as you know, 24-hour days in politics is, is an eternity sometimes. So, Do you really see anything, any fallout from this in Iowa at all? I mean, it's a big deal story for a while in Washington. But it's not a year from now when we're headed into the November election. Is this going to amount to anything? I mean, I'm on, the, I'm on the road three and four nights a week, you know, and I'm on the phone six days a week talking with activists. And I don't see any... Uh, any concern there? The overwhelming consensus I see among activists is they're not disgusted with Donald Trump and his administration. They're disgusted with uh, Republicans who made promises that they're not willing to fulfill. Mr. Jeff, do you see Donald Trump delivering on the agenda that he promised, given the, that we haven't seen action on health care, on infrastructure? On Let's face it, he's permit? trying to do that. But when you've only got a 52 to 48 majority in the, in the U.S. Senate and you have these Republicans that pay, play these games, uh, it's very difficult. I would hope so. Uh, and I think they better understand getting close to the 2018 election, they better deliver on some of these things or they may pay the consequences and then it will be not a real pretty picture. So, Mr. Gross, what are the stakes 
of this tax reform discussion that's playing out now, given the inaction on health care, on infrastructure, on some of these other agenda items? It's everything for Republicans. <clears throat> I mean, the one thing that you would think would unite Republicans would be tax cuts and tax reform. And if they can't get together on that, then, to Steve's point, they really failed the, the test of governance. Mm -hmm. Because they haven't been able to do anything on health care, they haven't done anything yet on infrastructure. But tax cuts ought to be the easiest thing to do. That being said, it's anything but certain that they'll actually do it. Uh, so if they don't accomplish it, what will happen will be they'll be, a, they'll be hell to pay in 2018 for Republicans. First of all, you have a Republican president who has 38 percent approval in his midterm of his first term. Usually that's a tough time for an incumbent party anyway. And then if you don't do anything you say you're going to do, it'll be a big year for Democrats in 18 if we don't do that. One reason that Republicans are having, that leaders are having some trouble getting this bill is there are still Republicans around who care about the budget deficit. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Scheffler, do Republicans care about the budget deficit? Well, Jeff absolutely. Lake, some Republicans are saying we can't support this if it blows a hole in the You know, absolutely, but Bob Corker, I don't even remember him talking about deficits too much until this time, until he has an ax to grind with the president. Uh, the bottom line is I think the economy will grow, but we have got to have something in place with this convoluted tax system we have, you know. If I had my wish, we'd go to a tax, a flat tax, but of course that's not going to happen, you know, but uh, we have to do something, you know, to get the economy going. Mr. Gross, um, what we can't budget do, deficits, yeah, debt? Um, budget deficits and debt are important until you get in control, David. That's the history of both parties. Uh, once they get, look at, you know, during the Reagan years, there were substantial deficits in order to, um, to implement the tax cuts early in his years, and that fueled a strong recovery that lasted through the 1990s. I think the same thing would happen here if we passed this. Uh, Mr. Scheffler, Steve Bannon has indicated that he'll maybe um, encourage <clears throat> primary opponents of some of the U.S. senators that are running for re-election. Do you expect any of Iowa's congressional delegation, obviously only the four congressmen, um, are up for re-election in Iowa. Do you expect any primaries there if there is inaction on tax reform? Well, I mean, it, I, I, th I think they're going to try to do what they can do, you know, our, our three congressmen and our, our uh, Republican U.S. senators, so I don't see that there's going to be any problem with them having primaries or at least any valid primaries. Uh, and I would hope that they'll be very picky about who they decide to primary because un undoubtedly some people probably deserve a primary, but not certainly the three congressmen we have and, and our two U.S. senators. Of course, neither one of them are up this time, but uh, I think they'll do what they can to deliver on tax reform. So, uh, President Trump has already had a campaign-style rally in this past June in Cedar Rapids. What sort of groundwork is there in Iowa for the Trump 2020 campaign, Mr. Scheffler? Well, as you know, the Republican Party is in the best shape it's ever been. Um, you know, Jeff Kaufman is the best of the best. By the end of this year, he'll raise around a million dollars, which will be a record for a non-election year or absent a uh, straw poll. And so the Republican Party is actually in a very, has a very strong structure. And so I think it's going to be a strong team going forward in 2020. And everywhere Jeff Kaufman is, he talks about the merits of this administration and as a big cheerleader, and of course, I think that in turn helps us in retaining our First in the Nation caucus status, too. And for viewers who might not know, Jeff Kaufman is the chair of the right. Iowa Republican right. Party. Speaking of 2020, is Iowa still going to be first, Mr. Scheffler? You're, you say, I, I preface that question <clears throat> by noting that you're on the, the Republican National Committee studying uh, the whole nominating process. So what's the latest on Iowa's status? I mean, you never say never because going back about two years, we had three successive RNC meetings where it was on the agenda at the Rules Committee meeting, and anybody, you know, on on, a, on the Rules Committee can put that on the agenda. And and uh, luckily, and hopefully by our salesmanship, we were able to save that, you know. So you never know what's going to come up, but I think of all the early states, we're probably in as good a position as any of them. Uh, one, because of the superb way we had conducted our caucuses uh, last time. But in addition to the fact that the whole Republican team, from all of our Republican elected officials to all the party officials, were on board with Donald Trump from day one. And, um, you know, Donald Trump actually said it, I think, at two or three campaign rallies, he wanted Iowa to stay first. And when Ronna Romney decided to run for chairman, you know, when she called me soliciting my support before I could even get to that topic of conversation, she said, I want you to know that I like Iowa and I like that, the status that they, that they hold. So I feel, you know, cautiously optimistic. But you still have to 
make sure that you present your, or put your best foot forward and make that case. So, but I, I feel pretty confident, so. Mr. Gross, how about you? Are you confident Iowa's gonna keep its first in the nation? I think position? we like we will for the same reason we have democracy, because it's a terrible form of government except for everything other. Right. Uh, and how, where else are you gonna start it? So it makes sense here, so there's a lot of inertia associated with that. But what I'm concerned about, frankly, are some of the things some of our party leadership is saying with regard to inviting people into the state of Iowa to contest this. Uh, we should never be in a situation where we don't invite people into our borders to have discussions about the future of our party and the future of our country because that, that's the nature of Iowa. Everybody gets that chance to speak up. And frankly, when a party chair of ours tells our neighboring senator not to step foot, foot in our state, that hurts our ability to retain the caucuses, in my opinion, long Mr. term. Mr. Sheffield, you're shaking your head. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. First of all, Ben Sass brought that upon himself. He repeatedly goes after the president. In fact, here this last week, it got even more bizarre. Uh, when he attacked uh, Sean Hannity and uh, Pastor Jeffers in Texas for Sean Hannity speaking at this church. So the guy is obsessed. And of course, when it came to the NFL, he again attacked the president, you know, talking about uh, apparently the, you know, the, uh, the president and the flag is on one side and everybody else is on the other side. So Mr. Sass invites it upon himself. And if he can't behave himself and get with the Trump agenda and start tackling the left as opposed to uh, attacking our president, then uh, he, he has what he has coming to him. So I make no apology for that, and I support our chairman full heartedly for what he's what? done to those people that do those things. I think it was things. a big mistake. It nope. should not be done. We are a party that should be able to listen to all voices. We, we, this is not an authoritarian regime. This is a democracy, and Iowa needs to be forefront of that. All right. Mr. So Schiffler, what the, so what is the, the Republican Party of Iowa position on the, the potential for a contested caucus? Will, will well, any, of course, if anybody can run, but I fully expect the Republican Party, the whole state central committee, and the committee man and the committee woman to be fully behind our president because he's done a great job. So again, anybody can run. Nobody said that they can't do that. But I fully expect our team to be on board. And quite frankly, if Iowa wants to re retain our First Nation caucus status, we can't have people wandering off and supporting all these other fringe candidates. That's the bottom line. Will Iowa be a fair level playing field as it has been in the past, Mr. Show? Well, as you know, right now we have a, uh, all the members of the state central committee can, cannot endorse a candidate right. uh, for president, or that was the last time. But I fully suspect that if Donald Trump runs for re-election, that we will change that policy so that we are not bound to remain neutral. So will the game in Iowa be fixed for the president? What, what's the point in other people coming I mean, after here? all, David, he is our incumbent president. He's done a great job. And again, anybody can run that wants to run. I'm not saying that they can't run. But I would fully expect the party well, operation. Steve, to be if they everybody. want to run and Iowa's first, then they have to be welcomed into Iowa so they can run. We can't say you can't set foot in the state of Iowa I and be open for the caucuses. That's a big mistake, no. and that could cost us the caucuses. Uh, no, long term. I totally That's disagree. A I totally disagree. When you have an incumbent president, it's a whole different ball game. What about what was done in 1992, where President George Herbert Walker Bush was challenged by Pat Buchanan? The Republican Party of Iowa didn't even do a count. Now, will that be the way that Iowa plays the game in 2020? Oh, no. I, we'll I, have I'm, caucuses, but we're not going to do no, it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive that we're going to have a straw poll where people's uh, votes will actually be counted. I'm, I'm not concerned about that at all. Shall we turn to some state-level issues uh, here? Um, Mr. Gross, parties in power often lose seats in a midterm. Uh, what do you think the outlook is for the State House, the State Senate, the governor's race in 2018? I think, uh, I think the Senate should be good, strong. If you look at the numbers, it should be in good shape. Uh, normally in an off year, as I said earlier, of an incumbent president, your, in, your incumbent party will lose some seats. So I think it's likely there'll be some lost seats. A lot of it depends, frankly, on what happens nationally. There could be a wave that washes over this and really has impact if they don't get tax cuts done. In the House, I think it's a little bit more difficult. They may have some retirements. A lot of that depends on the extent to which the Democrats recruit, recruit good candidates. On the, on the gubernatorial side, uh, I think it's likely that, the, that Kim Reynolds would be re-elected governor, assuming she gets through the primary, which I think it's likely she will, uh, because we generally re-elect incumbents in Iowa. We've had a long history of that. That being said, I think she'll be tested this session. And a lot of this will depend upon how well she does through the, through the course of the session. She needs to show some strength in the session, some focus and something that she stands for. And I think if she does that, she'll be fine. There, there certainly are some, some challenges facing this state with budget shortfalls, uh, ongoing uh, problems with health care, social services. What is the Republican case for continuing to hold the governor's office in both chambers? Mr. Scheffler. Mr. Scheffler. 
Well, first of all, if the Democrats had their way, uh, you know, we would be have far larger budget problems because the Democrats want to spend much more money than the Republicans did. So it's going to be their job, of course, to, to look at the budget and make sure we live within those constraints. But, you know, when you look at Kim Reynolds' uh, record on, on the RFS, Renewal Fuel Standards, that was a real test of her leadership where she basically wanted the president to fulfill his promise, and, and, and he did. So I fully sus expect that she's going to uh, exert strong leadership here and making sure that we have a good budget. So, Mr. Sheffer, I want to go back to Jason's question on sort of the handicap of how the midterm elections uh, look uh, to you uh, in Iowa. Good, bad, tough? For well, you know, when I travel the state, you know, at events around the state, Republican events, um, you know, they're as well attended as they were last year in an election year. People seem to be mobilized. Seem, people don't seem to be willing to want to sit out 2018. So I'm not sure that 2018 it is going to be uh, a bad set of circumstances after all because people fully understand, I think, again, it's not Donald Trump's fault. It's basically these Republicans that refuse to get on board, and that's who they're going to hold accountable. And so, you know, it depends from race to race. They may hold some people accountable, but I don't, I don't expect them to sit home on Election Day and uh, say, you know, let the Democrats take control of everything, you know. As the Republican National Committee man from Iowa, you're a member of the Iowa GOP uh, Central Committee. Mm -hmm. um, are you backing Kim Reynolds? You attended her uh, campaign fundraiser on October 21st. You know, if she had not been an incumbent governor, I would have undoubtedly not got involved in the race. Uh, but she is incumbent governor. I was asked to endorse her, and so without hesitation, I did that. And again, I don't, I don't have any qualms or any um, concerns about um, the mayor of Cedar Rapids running against her. But I think she's done a great job, and so I felt very comfortable making that endorsement. And of course, endorsements don't mean a lot, as you well know. People Except make for their yours, Steve. no, no. <laughs> uh, when I've made endorsements, some people don't aren't, ha aren't, aren't as happy with it. So, you know, people make their own decisions. But I feel very comfortable with it, and think she's done a great job. And as you know, she's the first female governor. But aside from that, just on her credentials, I think she's done a great job. She's a most well-prepared governor in history to take over. I think because she had a good mentor in Terry Branstad. Are you endorsing? In I'm not. I'm staying out of it. I've worked, frankly, with both of them uh, on think tanks for, with, frankly, with both of them, Committee of 82 with, with Kim and, and Engage Iowa with Ron. I think we're lucky to have those two people uh, because they're, they're both, they care a lot about the future of the state of Iowa. They're very studious and, and they know the issues. So I think we're, we're fortunate to have that. And frankly, I think a primary is a good thing. I think the Democrats learned in the Senate race with Bruce Braley that you can rue the day that you don't have a primary and test your candidate. And I think it'll help Governor Reynolds to actually be tested in a primary. Jason. Um, there, there's a, a national conversation playing out right now on the topic of sexual harassment. Uh, I'm wondering what, what you guys think might be the political implications of that conversation here in Iowa, given the settlement uh, in a, a lawsuit involving the Republican Senate caucus here in Iowa. Is that something that the Republicans are going to have to answer to in 2018? Mr. Scheffler? I don't know if people are paying much attention to it. Uh, but, you know, it is a concern, I think, you know, and um, um, I guess on a personal basis, I think they should have probably dealt with those people earlier and, and dismissed them earlier. But again, I don't know all the circumstances, but, you know, sexual harassment in any form is totally unacceptable. Um, and um, you got to, uh, you know, live up to pay the consequences, you know, for, for bad actions. So. Uh, it shouldn't be acceptable in the workplace, period. Mr. Gross, same question to you. Yeah. I mean, how, how do Republicans in the Iowa Senate, are they going to have to deal with this issue on yeah, the campaign? Yeah, day? of course they are. I mean, any time you use over a million dollars of public money to pay off uh, mm -hmm. somebody for a sexual harassment claim, it's a problem. I expect to see it in a lot of the Democrats' ads. And I, while people may not be paying attention now, they'll, they'll be paying attention then. So I think it'll have negative impact. We've got just a short amount of time left, and I want to turn to more, more of a big-picture question. Uh, is... Uh, is Iowa going back to being a Republican state? Uh, you look at the profile, we've talked about some of this here, of yeah. the Republican voter in, in Donald Trump's coalition. Older, white, uh, didn't go to college, um, blue collar. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at a profile of Iowa, and that sort of describes the Iowa electorate. So I'm wondering, Doug Gross, is, uh, is Iowa going to go back to being a Republican majority state for I think, a long time I think, I, I think Iowa is a red state today. Right. And, and I think if you, when you looked at the margin Donald Trump had in Iowa, it was greater than what he had in Texas. And so what you're having in the Midwest is culturally, 
you have a, the way you described it, David, is accurate. You have, you have a profile of a, of a citizen, a voter, who that fits the Republican and Donald, particularly the Donald Trump mold, better than it does the Hillary Clinton and Democrat mold. The question is, is that sustainable? Uh, because the concern about it is, that in my regard, that a lot of that, are, those are older people. Uh, those are people where the economy is passing them by. Uh, are they really the future? And so that's my concern for the Republican Party. I think I, my question is, how is the Republican Party today appealing to the millennials? How is it appealing to the young professionals that are going to be the future of Iowa? Mr. Scheffler, about 20 seconds. Is this Republican? I think as long as we have continued uh, strong leadership like, like uh, Jeff Kaufman or people like him, then I think the Republican Party will continue to make strides as we get the message out. So I wouldn't call it maybe a red state yet, but certainly a dark pink. And as long as we have the message right and we have the right candidates, I think Medium we'll rare, huh? yeah, <laughs> <laughs> continue on the right road. So well, It's a great conversation. <laughs> and thank you both for being here. Thank We're out you. of Thanks. time now. And thank you for joining our latest edition of Iowa Press. We'll be back next week with another program. Des Moines Mayor Frank County and Waterloo Mayor Quentin Hart join our conversation. Now, with state volleyball coverage next week, catch us Friday night at 7.30 just on our Dot 3 World Channel and Sunday at noon on our main IPTV channel. Iowa Press also rebroadcasts on our Dot 3 World Channel Saturday morning at 8.30. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yebsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.